All right. Uh, we had some great questions during the break, and I'll share some of those questions with, the, with you as we go through. Again, learn from my mistakes. As you guys know, you, you know this better than I do, door-to-door provider time is a big thing now. CMS is actually rating that, and we get scored from it as well. And so I'm going to teach you a little bit about our journey and how to improve some of those metrics as well. So you guys have seen a lot of this. I'm not going to be repetitive, but people are advertising their wait times right, all over the place as a way to get people to the emergency department. We just put in our Scripps Health Express program, which is kind of a mix between an office and an urgent care slash ER, and we have those wait times posted as well. So it's actually pretty cool because patients can look on, online. They can see how long the wait is. They can actually make an appointment. So it's not quite the urgent care, but in between, even if it's an emergency, not emergency, but something quick that they want to be seen for, they have the flu, they can actually make an appointment at the Scripps Health Express and be seen the same day. So there's a lot of competition out there. So we have to kind of pay attention to what's going on in the marketplace. You may have heard about CVS and Aetna kind of joining forces as well. There's a lot of pressure to kind of take those paying patients away from the emergency departments. So we do have to do better about getting those patients in and out of emergency departments so they actually want to come to us. So things to think about as well. Many of you have a provider out in triage. We actually started this way, many, many years back uh, when I was running the ER at Radies. And it's fascinating. As soon as we put a provider out front, we started with our NPs and PAs. We had between an 8 and 11% left without being seen rate, which, as you guys know, is outrageous. You know, you want to get down less than 2%. And the day after we put that program in, it went down to 3%. That's still high, I know, but from one day to the next, it was actually pretty impressive just by having the provider out front. Well, during the break, somebody asked me, but, you know, sometimes patients aren't happy, you know, if they see an NP or PA, and how do you handle that? that, that. It's just all about messaging. So I, what I told the PAs and NPs to say up front very easily is to say, Dr. Sharif and I, she's our attending physician today. We work very closely together. I want to assure you that I have access to her, and if you have any questions, she'll be right, you know, she'll be in to answer those. And, you know, there, if you would like to wait and be seen uh, by one of our physicians, that's fine too, but it'll be a little while you have to go back out in the waiting room. How many people do you think wanted to go back out in the waiting room? None of them wanted to go back. So we, we gave the patients an out by saying, I work very closely with Dr. Sharif or whoever the physician was, and that was just an easy way to kind of get over that. I don't want a mid-level seeing me kind of thing as well. So you can see our numbers they actually did really well. But what I will tell you that we forgot to do was to tell our patients what we were doing. So we got this great program in place. We had them in and out of the emergency department actually pretty quickly, especially for the quick things. And so we had one, the, the complaint, so the day before I put the program in, we had an eight-hour wait, which is insane, right, for just, yeah, that's just horrible, I didn't even tell you that, but it's true, eight-hour waits. The, the day we put in this program, we had a young kid that came in with just a little buckle fracture. He was seen by my nurse practitioner, got an x-ray, seen by the ER doc, put in a splint, hour and a half, in and out, start to finish, and a follow-up appointment with orthopedics. Same day, I got a complaint, and what do you think the complaint was from that mom? It wasn't there long enough. You guys rushed me. <laughs> it was more like you rushed me through. I thought, you got to be kidding me. Had you been here yesterday, you were doing eight hours, and today I get you in and out, and you didn't feel cared for. We rushed you through. So I was like ready to, you know, th throttle somebody. But then what, <laughs> how did I fix that? Any, any thoughts? And how do you fix that perception that you're rushing people through? We just, yeah, what we didn't do is advertise what we were doing. It's such a simple thing. But what it, we were so focused on the process, we forgot about the people. And we do that all the time. We put something really cool into play, and we forget to tell the patient. So next day, after I got that complaint, I started having my team say, you know what, we really value your time. We've got a brand new program in place. We're going to have you in and out of here in no time. Oh, they were royally happy. Patient experience scores went up. But it was, it was a lesson to me about advertising and, and really telling the people what you're doing when you do it. Just putting a new process in place is it, not going to work for you. The other thing we did, so now I'm at Scripps. We actually had a very small emergency department. We had to do something better. We were busting at the seams. And what we did was change the, the environment. So we had 25 gurneys. We switched some of those rooms out and got 32 beds instead. And we put in these recliner gurneys instead. So instead of taking one space, you know, for one big gurney, we put in either one of these chairs or one of those gurneys. So two, basically, two spaces in one, in one room. Does that make sense? So taking out the big one and replacing with two smaller areas. And same thing happened, I'll show you with our left without being seen rates. But what we did was change everything to sort of quick reg out front, not a big long history about fall history and suicide and all that stuff. We just kind of, suicide risk, we actually did a very quick triage and we decided where they would go. You know, do they go to the red section, which most likely is going to be admitted, or do they go to the you know, green where they're probably going to go home? We kind of did all of that out front. 
And so I'll show you that data as well. And then if you were in a room that didn't need you to stay in the room, so you, that kid I told you about that needed an x-ray, he didn't need to stay in a room, right? I mean, we got the x-ray, we know what needed to be done. We would put them in a separate waiting area. We talked about the Disney phenomenon. You want to keep them moving. You never want to put them back out in the waiting room because they hate that because they feel like they went to the beginning again. So we had a little internal waiting room. So you got your x-ray, you go sit over there. Or even we had chairs outside our rapid medical assessment area where my MP and PA were just a couple chairs where they could wait there and they feel like they're moving along so I can get the bed for the next person, right? And then we go get them back and where they needed to go. So that was sort of the, the, the idea behind this redesign. So quick screen, the bed's available. They go to one of the zones. Yes, there was crossover. Sometimes the green patient was actually really sick and had to get flipped over to the red. But again, this was quick triage. And, and pretty soon the nurses got very good about figuring out who goes where. And then into that... We call it diagnostics, radiology, and discharge area. So it was, it was kind of constant flow, right? All right. So you can see our metrics. We had an increase in volume, 11%, the year of the trial. But you can see pre and post time to provider went down. Our ED length of stay has gone down. It's, we're actually putting in brand new rapid improvement event right now to cut down on that ER wait time because we're busting at the seams in-house. So we've got to get people in and out a little bit faster but are left without being seeing radius. It has been kind of consistent around 0.2% since we put that in place. One thing we did forget, and I was talking to him, where's Doug? There's Doug. Doug was my first fellow. How, how old do I feel when my first fellow is now running a department in a big wig elsewhere? Um, but uh, now why did I say that to you? Now, I totally lost my, what were I talking about? Yeah, of course you can ask me a question. <laughs> Discharge. This is just we just average length of stay. So this is discharge. That's actually pretty good. So that's that sort of time to time throughput and everybody. That the inpatients take longer. We're about five hours on the inpatient side, which is you know beyond what we wanted to be at. So anyway, so we 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 have to change these metrics. One thing we did not do in this trial, which I think is was a mistake, and I'll share that with you as you're redesigning your ERs. We did not put in an area for sort of a consult room. It doesn't have to be very big, but you can imagine when we put two beds into what should have been one. One bed, there was no place for the family to sit. And if you think about, uh, in our department, a lot of the surveys are actually filled out by a family member, and there was absolutely no place for them to sit and feel like they were involved. There still isn't. We, we, we're trying to work on that. We kind of put, put people in and out of the rooms. And so think about at least having one little tiny room where you can flip people in and out to give them their diagnoses, right? And so um, you can, you know, feel free to ask questions along the way as well, but that was, was a miss as well. And we are encouraging people to sit at the bedside, and so now we've got rolly stools. The doctors are rolling the stools around, again, because there's just not enough space for a real chair. And I will tell you that I don't want you guys sitting on the beds. You know, we have scabies at the site. We have MRSA. The alarm goes off. It's really hard to sit on the bed, right? I do it if I have to. Kneeling can be very difficult, but we do have to get our docs to sit at the bedside. And so that was one part about the redesign that we actually didn't do very well, right? All right, we also have what's an ED case manager program. Anybody here have an ED case manager? Yeah, it's fabulous, right? Because I will tell you, as an ER doc, if you have somebody who was just admitted a day or so ago with congestive heart failure and they bounce back in, that's got to be a really good reason for me to send them home, right? I just, I'm just, that's just the way it is. I'm not going to send home somebody who just was admitted with CHF or, you know, had come in with MI and, and just say, okay, go home now, you're fine. That's just not something I want, that I want to take the risk for. But we have these ED case managers, and they have all the Milliman criteria and things like that, and they can come in and, and help us out with that. So most of the time when we are able to send these patients home, it's with home health. A lot of times, you know this, they don't need to be admitted. They just can't get their medications. We have a meds-to-bed program so the pharmacist can help get their medications that they need. And so it's been helpful for us, not only just with patients that can go home from the ER, but also starting the discharge process for, for upstairs as well if we need them to be. So if you don't have an ED case manager program, something to, to think about, and I'll tell you more about that as we go forward. Yeah? How many patients are you seeing? So here we go. She asked, how many patients? So great question. This was, a, this was a pilot study. I just got the brand new data. They're seeing, again, we don't have, it's not 24 hours. It's, it's just peak time. Oh, oh, RED. We have five, well, those are different emergency departments across town. So I have, I'm in charge of five different ones. Each one has a different, different volume. The case manager, so they're actually peak hours. So a lot of times it's between like 11 a.m. and, you know, 9 p.m. at night. And so each hospital has a different, you know, peak staffing hour. I just got the recent data. They're all seeing about 550 patients a month, so a total. Um, so that's a pretty good mix of patients. 
And on average, they, they say they're saving about 20 admissions per month. We may not sound like a lot to you, but it does all add up. And again, this was just in our pilot study, but they avoided admissions as well. So it's actually a really nice and easy program to, to put into place if you have the funding for it, right? But as we're moving more into the capitated model, some of you have seen those changes as well, right? Fee-for-service is kind of going away. We had an incapitated model with our accountable care uh, organization. We're part of the Medicare um, Shared Savings Program as well. So cost is a factor, and so we can save some days on that end. It actually helps in the overall hospital picture as well. So the, the ER is huge in the inpatient stream as well. So there's three different programs. You probably know about these as well, but just in case you don't, uh, there's a value-based purchasing program, which talks about patient experience. That's on the hospital side, which also takes into account return visits within 30 days, which we are accountable for, right? If you come, if you come out, bounce back to the hospital with an MI or CHF, pneumonia, I think it's COPD and HIP, uh, we get dinged on that. So yes, if they come through the ER and I'm going to admit them anyway because they have one of those diagnoses, we get a little ding on that one because they're bounce backs within 30 days. So you guys are contributing to that whole value-based purchasing program, which is a CMS program on the inpatient side. Then there's a hospital readmission reduction program as well. So if those, those categories bounce back within 30 days, there's a different program to ding us with. And there's another one called the hospital acquired infection reduction uh, program as well. So the ER is huge in helping with some of these government mandates that are just coming down top heavy time and time again. All right. So this is just a chart showing where most people went. A lot of it was home health. Some of them got uh, meds, you know, the medication assistance as well. So most of these patients are getting help outside in the community. I just talked to the case manager uh, yesterday, this week when I was getting the data for you. Some of it was as simple as Meals on Wheels which I thought was interesting that the ER now is starting to help people just get meals on wheels, which is something I would never have thought about doing through the emergency department, but it's, uh, it's pretty helpful as well. All right, and then we're going to talk more tomorrow about patient satisfaction scores and, and how, to, how to coach people. One of the questions I did get at the break is how do you deal with residents that are coming in and out of your department? I thought it was a really good question. It's easy to train your own residency program, but as you know, we see people, you know, we have family practice docs, we have pediatricians, we have, you know, pediatric residents and, you know, all surg surgical residents that rotate through. How do you get to them? Because they are affecting your press gainy scores as well. And so my answer to that was I actually just did a training session for my inpatient team, the hosp hospitalists, because they rotate through uh, the department, and did a training session for them as part of their lunchtime residency program. So it's easier to get to them before they come to your department. You you're too busy. You cannot do one-offs. And they all rotate at different times. You all know that, right? They come in one month and the next time, and then it's all, it's all over the place. So it's going to be very hard for you to coach them about patient experience in the moment. But if you can get to them up front, it's a lot easier, and so that's, a, that's how we handle that part of things. So if your team hasn't seen the survey, I am so surprised, even my own organization, I'm out in a lot in the field giving talks across the system, how many people have never even seen the survey before. And so one of your jobs is to get the survey in, the, in their hands because it's an open book test, right? So if you don't know the questions, you're not going to do very well on the test, and it's a really easy test, right? It's not that hard. So the questions are for the physicians, and the nursing questions are pretty similar as well. Courtesy of the doctor, and I'll give you some tips tomorrow on how to make that work. The doctor spent time listening to you, keeping you informed about your treatment, concern from comfort while treating you. That's really easy. You know, I'd love to make you more comfortable. Use the word, right? And I go and get him a blanket myself. They will remember, you know, the staff or the doctor going and giving him a blanket. It's something just simple as that one. And then concern for family or friends is really important. I can't tell you how important that is, but I'll give you an example. So my brother, 54-year-old brother, diabetic and a smoker, four little kids at home, just had an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest two months ago. Anybody here from Michigan, Ann Arbor, U of M, by any chance? Yeah, U of M? Children's, but still the same hospital, right? So my, he was having chest pain and diaphoresis and the whole thing. His wife decided to drive him to the hospital, and then he stopped breathing and started seizing. She thought he was having a stroke. He was actually anoxic, right? And so um, she actually panicked and thumped him in the chest. I think she just gave him an extra minute. I think she just did a cardiac thump, basically. So kind of woke up for a second and went back out again. She called 911, and they, they said, you better drive, because by the time we get to you, it'll be too late. So she drove through all the red lights and got to the emergency department. They yanked him out of the car. Somebody jumped on the gurney doing CPR like you see in the shows, right? And, and um, wixed him in the emergency department where he got some rounds of epinephrine, and they uh, defibrillated, him, defibrillated him a couple times. And... Uh, huge MI, but got him up to the cath lab pretty quickly, where he had a big block of his LAD, 100% block of his left anterior descending, which they were able to open up. What she remembers is the staff in the ER coming out 
to tell her what was going on and the physician coming out as well. And she remembers their kindness, which to me just warmed my heart because a lot of times we don't get that feedback, right? We do our thing and we're the unsung heroes in the emergency department. We never get to hear that feedback. And then she said the ER staff put her in touch with a spiritual care worker that was on that day. She sat with her while she was waiting for my brother to be in, in the cath lab. So I thought, you know, what an impact we have and we don't often get that feedback, right? So I actually was able to arrange for my brother. He's out of the hospital uh, going through rehab right now to go back and meet the team that took care of him. You can imagine what an emotionally uh, you know, draining, but also a, a fun day for everybody to be able to see their patient that they brought back. But again, it was the ER, keeping the, the family informed that was above and beyond anything that she remembered, right? What we, what we drop it on is the discharge. And think about your discharge processes for a second. What do we try to do? As soon as you discharge somebody, what do you, you feel like you, <laughs> you got to get them out of the ER as fast as you can? And we, we kind of drop it there. That's the time when your staff should be sitting at the bedside explaining what the plan is so we can keep them out of the hospital and give them other resources, right? And we blow it. And I'll tell you, I love the, the experience we had there, but at the very end, uh, the, the, we're in the ICU. There were no beds, so we stayed in the ICU for a couple nights extra. But she brought this huge wheelchair, and I've never seen such a big wheelchair in my life. And she said, okay, you guys are ready to go now. And I, I imagined myself, I'm kind of tiny, and my, you know, I maneuver my brother around the hospital to get to the entryway. It seemed a little daunting to me. And so I said, do you have a patient transporter? And she said, you know what, they're really busy right now, but you're free to go. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm free to go. And, and I, I didn't even know what to do with the wheelchair. Do I take it home? You know, what, what do I do with this? And so I thought, God, after all that great care, it was the, the discharge that should have been done better. If I asked for a, a transporter, it would have been very easy to say, you know what, the transporter is going to be about half an hour, right? We have a waiting room that's right here. You're more than welcome to wait there. Or feel free to take the wheelchair, because I know your time is valued, and we'll, we'll and just leave it at the front door. You'll see a bunch of other wheelchairs there. That would have made me feel better about choices that I had, right? And so we blow it on the discharge, and I see that through the emergency department as well. So keep that in mind as well. The other thing that's hard to do, though, is get feedback for yourself, right? Everybody's talking about the, the, the press gaining. How do we increase the survey count? What you can't say is give us a very good. You know, your survey's going to come. Give us a five on the, you know, you, that's the, the HCAPS police will, will not like you for doing that. But you can certainly prime the pump. And so what I've asked my staff to do is to say, you know, how's the care been? I ask, how's the care been so far? You know, and especially at the, even at the end, I say, how's the care been? And they say, it's been great. Everybody here has been fantastic. And then I say, you know what? You might get a survey in the mail or email. My staff would love if you fill it out. And I ask the staff to do the same thing. Because a lot of times, you know, the patients will say, you know, Dr. Sharif, whatever. And I want them to say the same thing, right? The biggest compliment I can get as an emergency physician is when patients ask me to be their primary care doctor. I don't want to be a primary care doctor. I don't want to hear about your grandchildren. I'm sorry, I just don't want, I don't want to deal with all that stuff, right? I went to ER for a reason. But what a huge compliment that that is for somebody to ask that question. And so I tell the staff, if you hear anything good about any of the doctors, especially towards the end, I want you to prime that pump, right? And say, you know what, you might get a survey in the mail. Well, I don't know if you guys have looked at this. We have looked at our press gainy and you know, ER and HCAP scores. Turns out that the patients who come through the emergency department score us lower on their inpatient HCAPS scores, which is actually not very fair. We get you know, surveys all the time. And I think we don't do a good job of priming them as well. They wait in the ER for eight plus hours, sometimes for a bed, right? So by the time they get upstairs, they're already grumpy. And then what we get is, yeah, I know you had to wait in the ER. And we kind of get dinged from, from the team upstairs. So the work we're doing now is to wipe that bleep, you know, the quarterbacking going on and say, you know what, when you're in the emergency department, here's what I want you to say. Instead of saying you're going to be here for a long time and the floor is not ready, why don't you say, you know what, while you're down here, we're going to continue the workup so that when you get upstairs, you're going to be able to get some rest. So they don't feel like they're wasting their time in the emergency department. And we keep saying, well, we're still waiting for the bed, right, things like that. And when they get upstairs, reinforcing that you got great care in the emergency department, we've got a lot of the workup done already, right, and so now we're going to be able to give you some rest. And so I think we need to do a little bit better working more as a team across the, across the system as well. So, the, you know, we, you guys know how to do this as well, but, you know, we know that acuity matters. What people always tell me is that, well, everybody that comes to the emergency department wants, wants a prescription, and actually that's not true. And there's study after study that show that's not what patients necessarily want, particularly in cases of antibiotics, right? The patients will come in thinking they might need antibiotics, but if you explain to them that right now would not start an antibiotic on you, and here's why, I always tell them about the uh, antibiotic-associated diarrhea that your child might get. I'm pretty sure you don't want that, 
right? And most of the time, they, I can talk them out of it. What I do a lot of, though, is, and there are studies about this as well, wait and see prescriptions. You guys heard about that, that concept? So I don't just give it just to everybody, but if there's a chance, especially with you know, a little bit of fluid in the ear, maybe they might need one, I will tell them, but you know what, I'm going to give you a prescription. I want you to see how you do in a day or two. If you get worse, go ahead and fill a prescription. So the one study actually showed that if you wrote a prescription, even if the, the child had had an ear infection and you wrote a prescription, 13% didn't fill them anyway. That annoys me. If I spend that much time on Epic, figure out the Zithromax dose, because it's 10 mg per k, then 5 mg per k, all that stuff I have to do, and you're not going to fill it anyway? Couldn't you tell me up front you're not going to fill it? That would be so much easier for me. But it turned out that the people that, that you gave a prescription to, the wait and see folks, 63, 65% or so didn't fill the prescription because they didn't need to. The rest filled it, and when the survey came back and asking them, why did you fill it? My kids still had fever, my kids still had ear pain. And so they were filling the prescriptions for the right reason. So if you're worried about them getting a prescription, they're going to go fill it right away. That actually hasn't been proven to be the case. So you can certainly do a wait-and-see prescription because the, what I don't like is I see a patient in the morning, right? I don't give them the antibiotic because they don't need it, and what are they going to do? They're going, someplace, they're going to go someplace if they really want one. Then they go to the urgent care center down the, down the whatever, and they get a prescription. And so guess what? I'm the bad doctor because some other doctor said they needed an antibiotic. Does that make sense? So by me saying, I don't think you need it right now, here's a prescription for you just in case, right? They're not going to fill it, and they're not going to go to another place and think you're a bad doctor in the first place, right? I see a lot of what I call no-titus media. <laughs> You guys know what that is, right? It's, it's somebody just done, written a prescription for absolutely nothing, right? But again, the patient feels better because they're put on something. I don't believe in doing that either, right? So I give them an out. Does that make sense? All right. But what they want is a contingency plan. More than the prescription, they want a plan. So what we had started doing before the study came out was saying, you know what? We want you to come back and get rechecked. If you don't have a primary care physician, come back here. You know, come back in 24, 48 hours for ear pain, and we'll re-examine you, right? And we'll see if you need antibiotics. Well, then we don't want everybody coming back to the ER either for that one, so we went to this uh, wait-and-see prescription, right? And so it's the same thing with abdominal pain. Give them an out. Right now, you know, you look like you're okay. It doesn't look like you have appendicitis, but that could change, and we want you to get rechecked in 8 to 12 hours, right? If you get worse, you come right back here, kind of welcoming them back to the emergency department is what's important. Right. Um, we want, yeah, absolutely want to keep them informed. I think that's the number one thing that we don't do very well. It's on the survey. I'll give you a really easy tip for that. I remember when I took over the ER radies, um, it, it, we saw our left without being seen rates. Everybody hated us. I didn't know where to start. Um, the inpatient team didn't like one of my hospitalists. She was a night, night doctor. They felt like she was a sieve and was admitting everybody. And then the orthopedist didn't like us because it took us forever to get the patient sedated. That The ICU didn't like us because their fellows should get priority over intubating and my fellows wanted to intubate. And then the community hated us uh, because, our, because our left without being seen rates were so high. And so imagine walking into that, that mess and trying to figure out who hates me the most? You know, where, where do I start here? And so we kind of did a multi-tact multi, uh, thing there. But what I did was to take that ER doc off nights because her perception was so bad that I just said, you know what, I'm going to take you off nights. Turned out, guess what? Her admission rate wasn't that much higher than everybody else's. It was just that perception. So by taking her out of the mix, it ended up being better. Uh, one of our ER docs, uh, you know, part of it is the perception of teamwork as well. And once you get labeled by the nursing staff, you guys know how that goes, right? You get labeled and everybody doesn't like you and you don't even know why you don't like that person. You were just told not to like that person, right? And so one of our docs, um, he couldn't figure out. He goes, the nurses just don't like me. I don't know. You know, I'm trying to do what they asked me to do. I just, I just feel like they don't like me. So I went to the nursing meeting. I said, you guys, I, I get this sense about Dr. Smith. You know, tell me what it is. And they sat there for, for a while trying to figure out what they didn't like about him. And the answer was they hated because he always sat in the same doctor's station. Every time he came into shift, he picked the same station, and through the whole shift, he just stayed at that station. And that was the root of all evil as to why they, they didn't like him. So I go back to him. I said, why do you sit in the same chair? Can't you go over there and go over here? And he's actually OCD. So what he does when he comes on shift is he wipes everything down. He wipes down the phone. He wipes the chair down. 
and nobody's allowed to sit in his chair because he's done all this prep work. And so when I told him that that was the reason, he goes, you've got to be kidding me. I said, he said, all they have to do, if I'm not listening, is roll my chair where they want me, right? And so that became the big joke of the department. When you want Dr. Smith, hey, roll him down the hallway and he'll go with you. Um, but it's amazing to me how these, these myths just keep getting perpetuated. And so part of your job is you've, if you have a doctor that's labeled, get to the root of it, right? You might be able to, to fix it very simply like I just did as well. This last line, if you're a member of my family, yeah, I used to say a lot, you know, if it was my child, this is what I would do. And then I got, I was a fellow, I didn't have a child. So then they said, do you have a child? And then I had to say, no, I don't. So don't make up a child, you know. <laughs> but, uh, so what, uh, what I do do differently, though, uh, is I, I'm tired of hearing that, by the way. I'm tired of hearing about treat everybody like friends and family. How long have you heard that for? I've heard it since I was, God, med student plus. Does it, and I will tell you honestly, it means nothing to me because when I'm taking care of a patient, I don't think, oh, that's my mom in the bed or that's my brother. I don't, I'm sorry, I just don't feel that way because I'm so busy. What I ask my staff to do, and my physicians as well, is to change that question. And if you take away one thing from this patient experience piece of, of this talk, it's this. Ask them the question, would you like you taking care of you? It's a different question, right? And that has been resonating uh, with my staff and my physicians as well because they go, you know, maybe there's the patient I told you about earlier today. I probably wouldn't have wanted myself to take care of myself that day. It was not, I wasn't on. And so I tell them, when you come through those doors, you put your white coat on, you're on show, whether you like it or not. And if you don't want you taking care of you, then find something else. But cha change that up, right? So that's a different question than treating everybody like friends and family. So think about that as well. All right, signing out, sign out is huge. I told you the example this morning about how we do sign out now, but we are so bad at that. I encourage you to go back to your programs and see if you are doing that or not. Even the nursing staff doesn't do it very well. We're supposed to do bedside report, and they do a quick handoff, and there, there really isn't that care. We don't feel like we're, we're caring for somebody. And a lot of times, to be honest, in the emergency department, we get sign over, and we say, don't go in that room. They're really grumpy. So what do we do? I go all the way around the ER to avoid that room. Come on, you've all done it before, right? <laughs> Or we, the best thing we do is sign them out AMA, right? We're like, high five, woo-hoo, and we send the poor nurse in there to sign them out AMA, right? Come on, I know you have. It, it's true, right? It is true. And I don't want to go by those rooms when people are standing staring at me like this. You know, it just makes me uncomfortable. And so we've got to change our mindset a little bit, right? And so one of my nurses said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try something a little differently because I get signed out like that all the time. It was a trauma patient that we had to watch in the ER for a while. And she'd been just horrible for the last few hours. And he decided to do something differently. So he went in. He sat down. He said, I've heard you had a rough couple hours. Actually, she was giving everybody else a rough time. But he, he turned around and said, I've heard you had a rough couple of hours. I want to make this better for you. You know, how, what, what can we do to, to make this better for the next few hours? Because you're going to be with us, you know, for a little bit while we're running the test and getting admitted. And she ended up telling him that she loved horses. And they just had this great relationship because he decided to do something differently instead of just taking that pass, pass over. Because it would have been very easy just to, oh, she's grumpy. Don't go in there and just do the bare minimum, right? So try. Try again the next time. Just because they're grumpy doesn't mean they're going to do the same thing with you as well. And then manage each other up. I think that's really important. Oh, what happened? Did I not do my... Maybe that's for tomorrow. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I have one minute. Is there a pressing question that one of you wants to ask me? Ah, I love that question. Okay, so the question is when I compare uh, the database, and we get press gain of those NRC and there's other people out there, do you do the all database or do you have, because we can do regions as well. We actually look at the all database because I want to see how I'm doing across country and that kind of, and it's too confusing to have different columns. We're actually taking all of those columns out of the press gaining report because our, our providers are very confused by what that means. And so we're in the process of removing and just doing the all database as well. So that's a really good question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so when we're board, back to that boarding question, it's, I tell them the same, we, we're, gonna, we're working on the bed for you upstairs. In the meantime, we're going to keep you as comfortable as we can in the emergency department, and we're going to keep going with the workup because the hospitalists often come down and write orders. We have orders. We're not abandoning them, right? We keep going. I will, the one last thing I will share with you is that we have hallway beds just like most of you do as well. And somebody asked me in an earlier break, you know, how do you deal with the hallway patients? And it's very easy. You do the same thing. We tell the patients out front, you know what, today, you know, you came on, a, on an exceptionally busy day, but we value your time. You can either be, we have a bed that's in the hallway, 
you know, we'll try and keep it as private as we can, or you're, you're welcome to wait in the emergency department until we, we get a proper room. I will tell you there's maybe, maybe one or two patients, and it's really just an STD-related thing where they don't want to be in the hallway, that said, you know, I want to wait for a private room or they have a rash in the groin or someplace. And usually we can get through that. But it's, it's giving them the choice, and, and they really, that, that has not affected our scores in some of the sites when they do it well. The ones that don't bother priming that pump, yeah, their scores are not very good because they don't explain what they're doing or why they're doing it. So that was a, a good question as well. Okay, I think I'm off. Yeah, thank you so much. Wasn't that great, you guys? That was really good. <laughs>